So this lecture is part of an online algebraic geometry course giving an introduction to schemes. At this lecture, we'll be discussing when maps of sheaves are injective or surjective or exact and so on. So last lecture, when we were given a pre-sheaf F, we constructed an etale space of F, which was a map from, uh, which was a space X, space A mapping to our base space X that F is a sheaf over. And you remember we did this by first constructing the fibers of A by taking a direct limit and, <coughs> and then gluing these fib <coughs> fibers together. Um, so we're first going to start by looking at a couple of examples of what this etal space looks like. So you remember this map being etal means it's a local homeomorphism in the sense that each point of A has a neighborhood that's homeomorphic to a set in X. Uh, so let's first of all look at the example where we take X to be the reals and we take X to be the sheaf of smooth functions. So um, F of U is just smooth functions on U. And um, the um, fiber at zero is just, you can just think of it as being germs of smooth functions at the point zero. So if we, if we draw um, a graph of a smooth function, um, it might look something like this. So we have a, a smooth function defined in a neighborhood of zero. And we might have another smooth function that say looks like this. But if these two smooth functions are the same in some neighborhood of zero, then they count as the same point of the fiber. So, so the points of the fiber are sort of germs of smooth functions where you can only see the smooth function very, very close to zero in some sense. And the point is this example, this, um, the space A in this case is not Hausdorff. So um, you sort of might think, well, it's locally homomorphic to the reals, so it's just a one-dimensional real manifold. Well, it is in some sense. The problem is it's a non-Hausdorff real manifold. So let's see two points at zero that don't have disjoint open subsets. So the first point at zero, I'm going to take to be the fiber of zero. So F is just equal to zero. The second point at zero, I'm going to take to be the following function. It's going to come down like that. And it's going to be zero there. And then it's going to have a bump here. And it's going to be zero there. And then a bump there and zero there and a bump there and zero there and so on. So this is G. And you notice that F and G different points in the fiber at zero because there's no open neighborhood where they're the same. These bumps go on forever. But any open neighborhood of G is given by taking um, some neighborhood of naught and the open neighborhood of G might sort of consist of the image of this bit of G. And similarly, an open neighborhood of F might consist of um, you, you take a small open neighborhood of zero and any, any function which is zero in that open neighborhood is, is in the image of F. But now you see any open neighborhood of G and any open neighborhood of F have a point in common because you can find some small patch near the origin where both F and G are identically zero in an open set. And that will give you a point in the same open neighborhood. So, so these etale spaces can be a bit weird because they can sometimes be non-Hausdorff. Notice that if, if G is the sheaf of analytic functions, then G is in fact Hausdorff. 
can do that as an easy exercise. You see, you can't get this phenomenon because if a function is analytic, it can't have a, an infinite chain of zeros approaching zero unless it is actually zero. So somehow the question of whether this pre-sheaf is Hausdorff or not Hausdorff is rather like wh whether your functions have a sort of notion of analytic and analytic continuation. If you look at smooth or continuous functions and the sheaves you get are not Hausdorff. If you look at analytic functions or regular functions in algebraic geometry, then the sheaves you get often are Hausdorff. So, um, so from any pre-sheaf, we can get the etale space. And from the etale space, we can get a sheaf of sections. So this gives a way of going from a pre-sheaf to an associated sheaf. And I'm just going to list some properties of this um, construction. Um, I'm not going to bother proving most of them. You can take these as, as exercises. Um, so um, first of all, um, this is indeed a sheaf. And it's universal if we have a map F goes to G, where this is a pre-sheaf, and this is a sheaf, then it factors through the map from F plus to G. So there's a, a, there's unique um, morphism of sheaves making this commute. So, so this is a sort of universal way. It's the best possible way of constructing a sheaf out of F. That any other way of constructing a sheaf out of F, you you sort of start with F plus and then embed it into this other sheaf. Um, so uh, also you can check if F is already a sheaf, then the map from F to F plus is an isomorphism. So if you try and turn a sheaf into a sheaf, you get back the sheaf you started with, not very surprisingly. Um, um, also, if A goes to X is already a tau, and F is equal to the um, uh, sheaf of sections, then the etal space of F is isomorphic to A. So in other words, what we find is that sheaves are more or less the same. So sheaves over X are sort of equivalent to etale spaces, A mapping to X. Um, so uh, incidentally, the reason for the name sheaf is you can think of the etal space A as being the union of the fibers or stalks. Um, so um, in sheath theory, when you talk about the fiber of a map from A to X, you quite often call that the stalk of a map from A to X. And a sheaf in agriculture means you get a lot of stalks of corn or something and bundle them all up. So if you think of these as being sheaves of corn bundled together, you can sort of think of the etal space A as being a bit like that, except that doesn't give a very good picture of the topology of A, but never mind. So a, a sheaf, when viewed as an etal space, kind of looks like a lot of stalks all stuck together. Um, and... Um, Um, in particular, if F goes to G is a homo is, is a morphism of sheaves, then it is an isomorphism if and only if it's an isomorphism of the corresponding etale spaces. which is the same as saying it's an isomorphism 
of all stalks. And this follows easily from the comments we made on the previous sheet that if it's an isomorphism of etile spaces, if the corresponding map of etile spaces is an isomorphism, then as we said, we can just reconstruct F and G from these etile spaces. And if the etile spaces are isomorphic, then that shows that F and G are isomorphic. Um, well, we define, we want to define um, whether, uh, uh, sorry, wait a minute, I better first give another example. So let's have an example of constructing the um, sheaf of a pre-sheaf. So let's take F to be the constant pre-sheaf, where we just put F of any open set U is equal to some, some set A. So this is going to be a fixed abelian group. And we saw earlier that this is usually not a sheaf. Well, so we want to work out what is the etale space of this. Can't spell etale. So the etale space of this, well, what's the fiber at each point? Well, the fiber at each point is kind of trivial to work out because f of u is just a. So when we take a direct limit, the fiber at each point is just a. And if you work out the topology on the fiber, you can see the etale space is just um, x times a mapping to x. So here a has the discrete topology. And now we take a section u and want to know what is f of u. Well, f of u is just the sections of this map here. So we want functions from x to x times a such that if you do that, then that you get the identity. And you can see this is just continuous maps from u to a. Now, since a is the discrete topology, this means that f of u equals a if u is connected. And I don't want to get into arguments about whether or not the empty set is connected. So let's just say it's connected and non-empty. A good case for saying the empty set is not connected, but um, anyway. And f of the empty set is just the zero. And if U has more than one component, then um, for instance, if, if U has two open components, then F of U will be A times A, sorry, this is F plus of, um, Sorry, this is the sheaf F plus that we can construct from the pre-sheaf F. So if U has two open components, then the sheaf F plus will be a product of two copies of A. And in general, if U is a union of open components, then F plus of U will be a product of copies of A. Um, you can get more complicated examples where U, where the components of U aren't open, in which case slightly more complicated things happen, but I'm not going to worry about those. Um, now, we now want to define whether or not a homomorphism of sheaves of abelian groups is exact or injective or whatever. Um, so we say this is exact if it is exact on the fibers. Similarly, um, F to G is injective or surjective if, it's, it, if it is on the fibers. So this is the definition of a map of sheaves being injective or surjective. Um, in case you're worried about whether or not this is the right definition, we've got a category of sheaves of abelian groups. And in a category, we say something, a map from A to B is on to if for any two maps from B to C, these are the same if the, if the composed maps from A to C are the same. So this gives a definition from map A to B in a, any objects in a category to be an epimorphism. And this definition 
is in fact equivalent to the one defined using category theory and similarly for injective ones. Um, you may wonder, um, so th this, this just says that maps of sheaves are injective or surjective if the corresponding maps of et al spaces are injective or surjective. And you may wonder why don't we just define sheaves to be et al spaces. In fact, you can do this if you want. I think it was sometimes done in the early days of sheaf theory. The problem is it doesn't really work when you do more general cases of sheaves over a category instead of sheaves over a topological space. Um, so the definition we gave of sheaves as being um, a map from open sets to abelian groups is the one that generalizes better. Um, so let's um, finish. Let's, let's do a couple of examples of uh, exact sequences of sheaves. Um, so first of all, we have a skyscraper sheaf. So a skyscraper sheaf is defined like as follows. We pick a point at P in X, we pick an abelian group A, and we put F of U equals A if P is in um, U, and F of P is naught if P is not in U. And let's try and draw the etal space of F. So here's uh, the base space X, and the fiber at any point other than P is going to be zero. So, so uh, we just get um, the sky, the, the, the etal space has, has a zero point here, but above the point P, you can see the fiber is A. And you can now see why it looks like a skyscraper because it looks like a sort of tall building just sticking up with, with everything empty around it. And now we'll see an example of the skyscraper sheaf. Uh, if we take, um, so this is the skyscraper sheaf of A. So let's put F, so this is the, no, sorry, so it's the etal space of F. So this is the skyscraper sheaf F. Um, and now we're going to let G be the sheaf of smooth functions on the reals. And we're going to define a map from G to G, which is just multiplication by X, where X is point in the reals. And at all points x not equal zero, you can see the corresponding map on fibers is an isomorphism. So this map is an isomorphism except at zero. And at zero, turns out we get the skyscraper sheaf here. So if we look at the fibers over each point, if we look at a point x not equal zero, here the fiber looks like naught goes to it's going to be some big space of all germs of functions at um, naught. So we get it looking like this, um, where this is an isomorphism because multiplication by x is an isomorphism. If x is equal to zero, then we don't get this. We get, um, if, if we've got a, a function at zero, then we can write it uniquely as a constant, the, the constant value of the function at zero, plus x times um, another smooth function. So at x equals zero, um, that the fiber looks like all germs of functions at zero, but this time um, the fiber is actually the real numbers. So we get the skyscraper sheaf corresponding to the point x equals zero, and A being the real numbers. So that's a non-trivial example of an exact sequence of sheaves. Um, incidentally, um, if you take any vector bundle over a space, then you can obviously form the sheaf of all sections of a vector bundle. So for instance, this um, sheaf G is the sheaf of sections of a smooth one-dimensional vector bundle. Now you see 
if you work with vector bundles, you have a bit of a problem because you can't really take quotients of vector bundles in a nice way. Here we've got two vector bundles, but the quotient of the two vector bundles is really a sheaf that isn't a vector bundle. And there's no way to get a vector bundle whose sections are naught everywhere except zero where they're, where they're the reals. So um, sheaves can be thought of as a sort of generalization of vector bundles that allow you to take quotients. Um, so we'll finish with an example that um, you probably came across in complex analysis. So for this example, I'm going to look at the following exact sequence. Naught goes to 2 pi i z goes to holomorphic functions goes to non-zero holomorphic functions. So here these are all going to be functions over the complex. These are all going to be functions over open sets of the complex number. So this stands for the constant sheaf of the group 2 pi i times z. And this is the sheaf of holomorphic functions. And this is going to be, when I say non-zero holomorphic functions, I mean functions such that f of x is not equal to zero for all x. So I don't just mean functions that aren't zero identically everywhere. I mean the functions not allowed to be zero everywhere. And this map here is just going to be the exponential map. And now we know that x of 2 pi i times any integer is zero. So um, the map from here to here and from here to here is indeed well defined. And now this is an exact sequence of sheaves. And the reason is that it's exact on fibers. Because if you take a point in some fiber here, it's represented locally by a little by a holomorphic function near that point. And if you've got a holomorphic function that's non-zero, then you can't always take its logarithm, but you can take its logarithm in the neighborhood of a point. So the map from here to here is indeed onto on every fiber. However, it's not exact on um, on sections of open sets. For example, suppose I take u to be the complex numbers minus the origin. And I uh, take the function in here to be the function x. Now, um, if it's the image of something here, then we would have to have a function um, f such that x of f is equal to x at all points. So we would need a global form of logarithm of f. But as you know from complex analysis, we cannot define the logarithm of x as a holomorphic function for all non-zero complex numbers, because when we go around the origin, we get this extra factor of 2 pi i turning up. So this is an exact sequence of sheaves, but it's not exact on some, if, if you take global set, the global sections of this over open sets are not necessarily exact. They might be exact. For example, if you, if you take um, u to be the whole of the complex numbers, then the global sections are exact. The, 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 the problem is whether or not this set u has um, non-trivial loops in it. Um, okay, next lecture we will be continuing discussion of sheaves.